Thank you for listening to this teaching from Casa View Baptist Church, located in Garland, Texas. Our mission is to love God, build relationships, and change the world. To learn more, visit casaviewbaptist.org. <coughs> Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Good job. Oh, wow. Today we conclude... Uh, our discussion about the Lord's Prayer. I, I, I love James Heath because he takes my sermon notes and make them, makes them look better and gives me great ideas. So instead of going with the title that I had, he came up with a question, how's your balance sheet? Truly, we know that this is a model prayer for us instead of Jesus' prayer because today we address the issue where Jesus says, forgive us of our debts. Jesus didn't have any debts. He walked this earth sinless, spotless as the Lamb of God. And so we know it's designed for you and I. But there's some things that he understood. He, he understood and he understands what are some of the things that limit us and debilitate us in our lives? Uh, the greatest thing is that instead of seeking the kingdom of God, we, we seek what we want, stuff. We, we become a humanist culture. Look where it's gotten us. I mean, think about it. What I want makes something right. We have more crime, more fatherless children, more debt more violence than, uh, th than ever. When, when I was a kid, I used to dream about the day I could drive my pickup truck with my hunting rifle on the rack in the back of the truck and park it in the school parking lot. Is not this not what you did when you were a kid? Where I came from, that's what kids did. You know, you know, I... You know, when we, uh, when we lived in Brock and it was deer season, you could listen to the high school kids because we were all in a cafeteria together. I mean, there's only like 30 of us, you know. And, uh, and they were talking about hoping to get out of classes so they could get to their deer stands. And so they came in their hunting clothes and their pickup trucks with their 30-30 in the back window. And, of course, the pickup truck was never locked and you never worried about it. What's changed? As our founding father said, you can't have democracy without character. So Jesus deals, I think, with, with three or four things that probably debilitate us the most in our human lives. Number one, instead of seeking the kingdom of God, functioning the way God designed this, we function the, to do what we want. What I want makes something right. No, number two, the lack of, of, of raw materials in life. I mean, think, raw materials, you need, you need time. You need a place to rest. You need security. You need, you need food. You need clothing. That's why we talked about last week, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Just ask God to give you what you need to function in your life. Today, I think, is the third most debilitating thing is that most people carry a balance sheet that's negative instead of positive. The Lord's Prayer goes like this. Then this is how you should pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debtors, or excuse me, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Today I want to focus on, on, on one specific verse, and that's verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The, the word that he, he is asking is, is, is that you and I need to ask God to forgive, which means to release all claims. Just let it go. The only problem about it is, is that 
somebody has to pay for something. We, we live in a world that forgets that. Every, everything that happens, there's an expense to it. I mean, think about it. If you want to go play golf, what are you going to have to do? You're going to you're, you're gonna have to make sure you got some clubs. Well, I can borrow them. Okay, well, great. Who are you going to borrow them from? Well, I'm going to borrow them from my buddy. Well, where did he get them? Well, he, he, he found them laying on the street. Okay. I have never known a golfer that played with a golf club borrowed from somebody that was found on the street. The point about it is, is that somebody had to pay for that golf club at some point in time. Somebody that made it had to pay for the iron or the graphite, the rubber or the leather that's going to go around the handle. There is nothing that is free. So you just can't go... No, you had to pay for the golf club. You got to pay the green fee. Unless... It's a county or a city golf course, municipal golf course. And by the way, I want you to know that all of you are paying for it. It's called taxes. That is free. But you know what else? If you're going to play golf, if somebody gives you the free tee time for free, gives you the clubs, you know what it's still going to cost you? Time. And your kids are going to go, well, you know, dad could be playing with us. Your wife could go, well, you know, he's getting off work early. He could come home. The Bible says, redeem the day, the time for the days are evil. There's always going to be an expense. That's why the Bible says, while when you and I were sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. In the book of John, chapter 19, verse 30, the last thing that Jesus said on the cross, and when he had received the drink, he said, It is finished, testelestai. With that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. The word testelestai is, is used in, in three specific circumstances. It is a legal contract has been fulfilled. You, you, you have this, you, you, you have a contract that you're going to do something and somebody says it's been fulfilled. Number two, the obligation has been fulfilled. One of the greatest times of my life have been when I've gone to a bank and borrowed money to buy something and you sign a contract and on the end, when it's a vehicle, you never get the title to that car, do you? But, but once it's paid in full... You get the contract and it says paid in full and you get a title where the bank releases the lien. The first car that Shelly and I bought was during the Jimmy Cotta administration and we bought a Mazda 323, 19.5% <coughs> interest. Woo! We paid on it for four years, went to seminary on it. Matter of fact, I'll never forget, on a Wednesday night, we were driving to the church I served at. It rolled over 100,000 miles in the middle of Lake Pontchartrain. We pulled over into a median and said, God, thank you so very much. This car's lasted 100,000 miles. My, I grew up, my mom and dad always traded something. I said, God, would you give me another 100? After it rolled over 200, I said, God, would you give me another 100? At 235,000 miles, <coughs> Shelly said, sweetheart, we've got three kids. They all just don't fit in the car. We've got to do something. I said, honey, it's only got 235,000 miles on it. I'll never forget, I put a for sale sign on it. Ten minutes later, a guy stopped at the parsons and said, preacher, you selling that car? I said, yeah, I sure am. It's got 235,000 miles on it. He said, how much do you want for it? I said, I don't know how much you got. He said, I'll give you $600. And I said, let me go get the title. I go inside and say, Shelly, where's the title? And she says, I don't know. I've never seen the title of the car. So I said, I don't know where the title is. And so I called Mazda Credit and said, this is Carl Tingle. And uh, I've got this Mazda 623. 323 or six, what, what, 323, whatever the stupid thing was, is four-door red, 
brown cloth into you. It only was in two floods in New Orleans. And all you got to do is get a wet back and suck the water out of the tailpipe. But anyway, <coughs> I revealed it all. But anyway, the guy said, I'm not going to give you the $600 until you, till you give me the title. I said, well, okay, I'll get the title. It's no problem. So I called Mazda Credit, and they said, uh, sorry, Mr. Tingle, we can't give you the title in the car. You hadn't paid it off. And I said, I, I paid every, every single, I paid, I paid every note, all 48 of them. I paid over 19% interest. He said, well, no, sir, you, you haven't satisfied the entire contract. And I said, what do you mean? Well, <clears throat> back in 1986, December of 86 and January of 87, you were more than 15 days late. I was, what? Well, you were over 15 days late, and there was a late fee of $8.26, and so you owe $16.50, and if you'll pay that, we'll send you the title. you got to be kidding me. He said, no, sir, it was 17 days late one month, and it was 21 days the, the next month. I said, well, what was the problem? I said, well, I was in seminary, didn't have a job. I was selling peepholes door to door. I wouldn't have paid those if my mother-in-law wouldn't have sent me some money to pay my car note so y'all didn't repossess it like you told me you're going to by a certified letter. Well, sir, if you'll pay off those late fees. I said, dude, do you realize that's 10 years ago? Sorry, sir, but you got to pay it before we'll send you the title. I went and bought a certified check. That cost me $5. overnighted it to them. That was another $19. I spent almost $100 trying to get the title, I, but I got me a letter that said, paid in full, with a title that says the, the lien is released. Jesus on the cross said, Testelestai. Your overdraft fees have been paid. The third after a military campaign was over and the other army had surrendered and the battlefield would be clean, the general would stand up and say to his troops, Testelestai! And they would cheer because they had won the victory. Do you understand that for every obligation, every debt in your life, Jesus has paid for that? I love that old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The fourth verse is even better. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Jesus looked at God and said, God, would you forgive us our debts? In Philippians chapter 2, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used by his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of the servant, who being made in the human likeness, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus Christ went and, and died on the cross to pay the penalty. I love what verse says, therefore, because Jesus did this, God exalted him. Love that part. Verse 12, therefore, because of this, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become what? Blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. You will shine among them like stars of the sky. Children without fault in a warped and crooked world. Do you understand because Christ died on the cross that you and I can stand before God in this world without fault, without guilt? 
And when you and I do that, we will shine among them like stars of the sky. And all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. Most people don't shine because they perceive themselves to be flawed. Flawed in their ability, flawed in their looks. I want you to know I love my wife. We've only been married for 37. I'm praying for another 37. But you know, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes my wife is just not smart at all. Now let that sink in. <coughs> My wife will get dressed and she'll fix everything all up and she'll ask me a question. How do I look? And every time she says it out of curiosity, wondering what I'm going to say. And for 37 years, I've said the same thing over, baby, you look good. I'll be honest with you, in that you look good, if she'll listen, there's hunger, there's longing, there's desire, and there's honesty. Since the first time I asked her to marry me, there has never been a time that she hadn't looked good. You can put a toe sack over my wife, and to me, she's going to look good. For the last two weeks, she's been covered in poison ivy bumps. Looked pretty good to me. Why? Because I love my wife. One of these days she's going to figure that out. It's fine with me. To me, because of my love, she's flawless. Can I ask you a question in all, all the times of your Christian life? How many times have you said, God, I, I just don't know if I can do that? Actually thinking that it's possible God might say, nah, you can't. When in the world has God ever looked at you and said, I don't want to spend any time with you? If you and I in our failure, in our sin, God said, son, I want you to die for them, do you think it's possible, maybe, that you're selling God's love short? You see, often what fills our balance sheets with negativeness is our perception not God's. I minded my own business the other day and came across this song and video. And I hope that it expresses what I'm trying to teach you today. There's got to be more than going back and forth. Introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is a cross has made. The cross has made you flawless. The cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the
wrap him up in righteousness But that's exactly what he did No matter the bumps No matter the bruises No matter the scars Still the truth is a cross has made The cross has made If you don't get anything from what I have to tell you today, you need to understand that the moment you said to Jesus that, yes, God, I believe you, I trust you. I believe your son died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin before God, you became flawless. And the only thing that limits you is believing that you're still in debt. Do you understand that? But Carl, you don't understand. I'm old, my body's falling apart. Guess what? Do you think God doesn't know that? Do you think God hasn't planned your life out into my neat detail, detail so that in every moment of it, God has a plan for you that is glorious, that is wonderful? You are flawless before God. And you have a purpose. Here's your problem. The only person that believes that you're still in debt is you. Satan comes into your life and says, I know what you did. Yeah, buddy, so did God. Some of my friends from when I was younger said, I can't believe you're a preacher. I can't either. I didn't want to be one. Do you remember when we went to the roof? Yeah, I remember. Jesus died to pay for all of that stupidity. That's gone. It's gone. Now I want to meddle for just a minute before we go. Jesus didn't just say, 
forgive us our debts. Whew. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Woo-hoo. Matter of fact, he gets downright ornery in verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Now, people have looked at that and said, well, Carl, what that means is our salvation depends on our ability to forgive others. Come on, guys, that's not what he's saying. To add anything to God's free gift of salvation is just simply malarkey, bull. Jesus' death on the cross was enough to pay the penalty for all of our sins. Here's the deal. If you and I hold claim to others, you know what that's going to cause? Us to hold claim to our own. I think today in our culture, one of the most difficult times that it's going to be to be a Christian is you and I need to understand there is no excuse for not loving people. I was having a discussion with a lady the other day that says you Christians are all alike. Y'all are all mad at Budweiser because, because they had a, a, a man dressed as a woman on the beer can. And I said, well, man, I happen to be a Baptist and you're not supposed to drink. At least you're not supposed to let people know you drink. I don't drink Bud Light. Well, what, are you a Michelob person? And I'm going, well, man, I don't, I, don't, I don't drink beer. Oh, so you're one of those people. And I, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you don't believe people ought to drink. I said, well, if somebody that drinks wine or beer is going to hell, then I'm going to go to hell too because Jesus turned water into wine. No, ma'am, I'm not saying that. What I'm simply saying is I could care less who Bud puts on their can. Well, she said, you need to understand that I go to, that I go to, to gay bars and now in gay bars we're getting rid of our Bud Light because because they're no longer supporting him, putting him on the can. I said, well, ma'am, I thought you said he was a woman. Well, you know what I mean. So now they're getting it from people that don't do and people that do do. And she said, and it's all you Christians' fault. And I said, do what? Man, I don't drink beer. I don't care who they put on their can. Well, y'all started all this junk. And I said, well, hold up, man. Can I, can I ask you a question? I said, did you ever, oh, Lord, help me, in the cigar shop. She's already mad at me. I said, ma'am, did, did you ever use Aunt Jemima pancake mix? Oh, I'm so glad y'all got rid of that. I said, ma'am, I, my mother was doubly racist. We had Aunt Jemima pancakes with Miss Butterworth syrup on it. Well, we needed to get rid of that. And I said, well, man, that means that you're a Christian and you hate people and you're bigoted because you made me get rid of my syrup that I like. But I just want you to know, ma'am, even though you got rid of my pancake mix and my syrup, I just want you to know that I love you and Jesus Christ gave his life so you could have abundant life and I'm praying that you'll have a wonderful day. Why do you have to be so mean? I said, man, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Well, if you don't think he should be on the can, I said, well, man, first it's a she, not a he. But, but you know what I... Ma'am, I don't care. Whatever his name is, do you know that God loves him? God loves him so much that God sent his very own son Jesus down the cross that he could have life just like he did for me and just like he did for you. You see, as a Christian, I do not have the right, I've not been given the ability nor the authority to hate anyone because of what they do. I can't do that. Matter of fact, Jesus says as a Christian, your job is not just to love people that are lovable. Your job is to love your enemies. 
Pray for those that despitefully use you and saw, say all manner of evil against you. Well, hold up, Carl. No, I, you're, you, 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 you hate people like that. No. You see, I'm caught in the crossfire. I'm called by God to love all people no matter what. But I'm also called to stand on the truth and validity of God's word. I can't compromise God's teaching so that people find it acceptable. But it also doesn't mean that I have the right or permission to hate anyone. You see, to love your neighbor means that you and I hold no debt. We don't. What does that mean? It means that a agreement is not required to love your enemy. An enemy is somebody that's trying to hurt you, so you mean I'm supposed to agree that they have the right to hurt me? No. I don't agree with them, but I'm called by God to love them. You see, you and I will never enjoy our faultlessness until you and I agree to forgive others. The truth is, you'll never forgive yourself until you learn to forgive others. That's what Jesus is trying to say. I just want you to know Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you would live flawlessly. In the morning when you get up, you're getting all fixed up and dolled up, and you say, okay, God, what do you think about me? If you'll listen every single day, God will say, you know what, I love you. You are beautifully and wonderfully made by God. I have a great plan for your life every single day. As the band comes up to lead us in our invitation, after God tells you that, some of you are going to go, God, but but you don't understand, I can't. Do you, you, you think God doesn't know what you can or can't do? He made you with every capability that you have. He intimately knows you. So every day, every day, Father, I pray that your kingdom would be manifest in my life. God, today, I pray that you would give me everything that I need to be the man, to be the woman, to be the child of God you created me to be. And Father, today, I need you to forgive me of my debts, my flaws, my insecurities. Father, I need you to help me forgive others. Father, the desire of our life today is that we would shine as the sun in the darkness in our world that's filled with trouble, depression, anxiety, fear, hatred, bigotry, meanness, and downright orneriness. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. If you'd like to talk or pray with someone while we're singing, I'll be hanging out in the back.